Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar um, called Understanding Restrictive Covenants. I'm delighted to be joined by Steve Johnson, uh, Key Account Manager of CLS Property Insight. Um, just before I hand over to Steve to run the webinar, um, I would just like to draw your attention to the Zoom uh, software that you're using. Um, and you have a couple of buttons within there. You've got one that's chat and one that's Q and A. As we go through the session, if you could use the Q and A to ask any questions, and someone has already asked a question actually, which is, will this be recorded and available for download after the session? Um, the answer to that is yes, we are recording this and we will share slides and the uh, web link as well in order to view it. Um, if you're interested in other webinars, you can follow InfoTrack's YouTube channel where most webinars are actually recorded and uploaded to. So as if you miss one, you can uh, have a look there. So please and all, uh, you know, go on to YouTube and, and log in there. But if you can use the Q&A to ask any questions, we'll try and answer them as we go through. Um, the likelihood is we'll have to come back to them at the end of the webinar um, once Steve has finished talking. Um, Steve. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to yourself to um, kick us off and begin the webinar. Lovely. Thanks very much, Adam. And hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest in the series of webinars that Edinburgh Track have been putting on uh, throughout this slightly strange period that we're all experiencing. Um, as Adam said, the uh, topic today is understanding restrictive covenants. Um, I'm Key Account Manager at CLS Property Insight. And for those of you that have uh, not worked with CLS before. We're actually a series of businesses. Um, Property Insight, the uh, company that I work for, specializes in residential and commercial legal indemnities. And our uh, thanks to InfoTrack as one of our, our, our primary distributors of those policies out to yourselves. Um, we have our risk solutions business, which deals with uh, a number of forms of pre-planning policy, right to light, judicial review, structural indemnities and contaminated land, all picked up in the course of, uh, of the development process. We have underpinning our, our group, um, CLS Data, which aside from the work that they do with lenders and insurers, also manages a whole range of the different data and risk modeling that we rely on. And indeed, our colleagues at Future Climate Info also rely on um, FCI providers of environmental reports. But as I say, I fit into the uh, CLS Property Insight side of the business. So uh, the topic today reflects ourselves, which is, of course, restrictive covenants. So over the course of the next few slides, we'll consider what are restrictive covenants and why they're in place. Um, throughout the presentation, we'll touch on typical examples of restrictive covenants and, of course, how they impact on property lawyers. Uh, we'll consider the issue of investigate versus insure. How do you consider the enforceability and, and deal with those restrictive covenants? And we'll have a look at the CLS Property Insight policy and how it deals with restrictive covenants as well. So I hope a useful agenda. Um, and as I say, if you do have any questions throughout the presentations, please do post them. If we can't answer them in the course of the presentation, then Adam and I will come back to you as soon as we can straight afterwards. So let's get started by considering what restrictive covenants actually are. Well, they are binding stipulations that are written into a property's deeds or contract by a seller to regulate what a home or property owner can or cannot do with their house or land under specific circumstances. And these covenants can bind or benefit subsequent landowners. How do they arise? Well, typically sellers impose certain terms on buyers to protect the land they were selling on the grounds of what they believe to be important. These restrictive covenants placed on the new title then persist as ownership changes hands. And a simple example is where the landowner, the seller may not want their quaint cottage bulldozed for redevelopment. So they might covenant against development full stop or put certain restrictions on what could be built. And the question is generally what happens when restricted covenants are visited, uh, revisited several generations or several purchases later on. One of my colleagues has dealt with a law firm who were representing a client seeking to convert a building into a nursing home. And aside from all of the other development hurdles, it turned out that this building had an ancient restrictive covenant pro prohibiting occupancy by anyone not of sound mind. Now, you can decide whether this is a, a fair or enforceable covenant, either uh, 
for the original purpose or uh, in its intent, in now intended use. And it's an odd example, but I, I think it serves to introduce the idea fundamental to all restrictive covenants and resulting claims, that being that the characters involved and their motivations and intentions are critical. You know, what were the motivations of the people who originally established the covenant when the land was originally transferred? And what is the best way of dealing with them for a modern purchaser? Now, generally, the reason for the covenant being imposed, typically on the purchaser, is that the covenantee, usually the vendor, wants to protect other land or property they own or retain in the area, often including any that may adjoin the land that's been sold off. And once imposed, the covenant runs with the land itself through future purchases. Now, in many cases, covenants are drafted to uphold particular requirements in respect of a resident of an estate, residents of an estate. Housing developers and property management companies will often apply restrictive covenants to inhibit owners from starting work or other practices which could impact the neighbourhood. For example, it may set limits to maintain a desired level of uniformity between the properties or to stop an area's character changing. Now, the house you can see in the image is actually from my hometown of Southampton. I can tell you right now that Southampton doesn't look like that across the board, but nonetheless, uh, in amongst all the, uh, the houses that were built in the 50s and 60s, are houses that were built by an architect called Herbert Collins in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. And in fact, my dad lives in a Herbert Collins house. Now, anyone holding the freehold of one of these properties has to oblige with a number of restrictive covenants ranging from limitations on exterior paint color, limits on putting in double glazing, and in fact, you, you can only have secondary glazing, you have to maintain the, uh, the original windows. Um, if your property contains shutters, you can only remove them temporarily to maintain them, they have to go back up. And there are certain interior restrictions as well. Now, all of this has put the brakes on my dad's extremely enthusiastic DIY. But again, it's an example of how restrictive covenants are in place to maintain the character of a uh, of a particular region now just as an aside there are also positive covenants which set out what the owner must do in respect of a property for example maintain a boundary fence or make a payment for a service charge positive covenants generally do not pass on to future purchases and once the land is sold these covenants cease and can no longer be enforced and we don't provide legal indemnity cover for positive covenants and this is because a positive covenant is generally something that someone has to do. For legal indemnity insurance purposes, we would not class having to maintain your own garden or house as a financial loss. Now, at this point, we're going to introduce some typical restrictive covenants commonly seen on title deeds. And now, these might include covenants that place a limit on building a certain volume of residential properties on land or even completely prohibiting redevelopment. And we'll have a case study on this type of restriction a little later on in the webinar. A covenant may provide that no alterations be carried out unless plans have been approved by the vendors or their architects. And this may apply beyond the bricks and mortar of a property. Requirements to seek approval on pruning or pollarding trees are not uncommon, even if the tree in question has no TPO associated with it. You may not be able to build past a specific building line, or there may be height restrictions, for example, a maximum number of floors on a uh, proposed construction. And there may be limitations on, for example, no trade or business to be operated on the property or, or prohibitions of specific types of trade. Once again, some of these can seem entirely reasonable, while others are a product of their time and era. And you can see on screen this rather nicely worded restrictive covenant that dates from some time back, where a property owner is not to erect or allow to be erected upon the piece of land hereby conveyed at any time hereafter, any beer shop, public house or hotel for the sale of malt or spirituous liquors. So if um, spirituous liquors was gonna be your main business, then this property might not be the, uh, the one for you. Now, at this point, I wanted to touch on protective entries. As well as known restrictive covenants, it's not uncommon for office copies to contain protective entries. And this arises where a certain document would have been submitted to the land registry on first registration of the property, but is now lost. That document may have contained a restrictive covenant, which would still apply to the modern per occupier or purchaser. 
whose content and purpose is now unknown. The missing document that may, with the emphasis on may, contain a restrictive covenant could have been lost for any number of reasons. And examples we've come across have been documents that have been lost or damaged beyond legibility due to flood damage, documents lost when solicitors' offices were hit by wartime bombing, or even just loss of files during a particularly chaotic office move. But whatever the reason, the outcome is the same. There's a, there's a gap in the documentary history of the property, and that gap might have contained a restriction relevant to the prospective purchaser. The covenants, if they existed, might not even have been breached, given they're unknown, and therefore there could be no risk whatsoever. However, the risk introduced just by the document gap mean that commonly, means that commonly insurance is considered on a just-in-case basis. Now, in the previous slide, we mentioned restrictive covenants whose purpose was to limit certain forms of development or trade activity. And the case study we'll look at here, here, excuse me, here revolves exactly around that. It also is an example of the imbalance of power that can sometimes arise around covenants where one party has considerably more knowledge of the topic than the other. And this is an example where the presence of a restrictive covenant indemnity was critical for the homeowner who benefited from it. Now, it's not uncommon for land agents claiming to have the benefit of covenants to send letters out to individuals. The letters tend to have fairly minimal explanation and request money from the property owner to have the covenants removed. And while the covenants usually do exist, they would often date back to when a housing estate was constructed and sometimes have little relevance, especially to a property owner who had made little or no alteration to their house. Homeowners with little knowledge of property law may feel compelled to make payments after receiving these kinds of letters. And fortunately, holding one of our restrictive covenant policies means they can bring in an expert to review the request, removing that power imbalance I mentioned. CLS claim handlers can assess the enforceability of covenants. Um, in this example, a company sent a letter to a CLS policyholder claiming to have the benefit of restrictive covenants. And it claimed that the policyholder had breached the covenants by firstly adding satellite dishes and aerials to the property, but also by parking trade vehicles on the driveway. Now the company in question request, was requesting 300 pounds to enter into a deed of variation with the policyholder. The policyholder notified CLS and claims handlers were able to challenge the company in question to prove their ability to enforce the covenants and we didn't hear back from them. So needless to say, the policyholder did not have to pay that 300, but of course, not only that, but the in perpetuity policy remains in force to protect them going forward. And again, I think it's perhaps pertinent to mention there, of course, what the um, policy covers is a potential payout should one be necessary, but of course, it also provides um, access to expertise that a property owner would otherwise have to pay for themselves were they to cite one of these letters. Now, as shown by the examples we've touched on so far, it's important that restrictive covenants, whether they are historical oddities or more fundamental to current occupiers, are dealt with there and then. Because the issues surrounding restrictive covenants can often be technical in nature, it's advisable for an individual to seek legal advice as soon as possible. And as a conveyancer, it will be your responsibility to review the relevant covenants that are recorded on the land charges register, as well as look at the wording of the covenant to ensure that it's correctly drawn up and therefore enforceable. A restrictive covenant will generally be enforceable between the original contracting parties as a matter of contract, but there can be situations where this is not so. For example, where the covenant is too uncertain or ambiguous to be capable of enforcement, the covenant is prohibited by competition law and again is considered unenforceable. Or maybe the covenant is contrary to public policy, for example, it contravenes equality laws. And for the covenant to be enforceable between successors entitled to the original parties, the following rules for the passing of the benefit may apply. The covenant benefits land owned by the person seeking to enforce it. Uh, the covenant must touch and concern or relate to the land owned by the person seeking to enforce the covenant. For example, the covenant affects the nature, quality or value of the land. 
and the person seeking to enforce the covenant must either be the legal owner or have some recognized interest in the in, in the equity a um a beneficiary in a will would be an example of the latter but having established the possible enforceability of a restrictive covenant a conveyance would usually look for options where insurance can be obtained to cover the liability of any future further breach of contract those liabilities could include damages or compensation alteration costs reduction in value of the property as well as legal expenses incurred and we'll have a an example of the impact of legal expenses shortly enforceability of covenants is a complex area which is why if you come across one on a client's title it may be that insurance is the preferable option especially when considered in terms of speed and expense of insurance versus investigation What then might be the steps and implication if a restrictive covenant is investigated rather than insured? Now, if for some particular reason insurance cannot be obtained, then the owners of the property could approach the individual with the benefit of the covenant in order to obtain retrospective consent for the works. If that person cannot be traced or refuses permission or seeks compensation for the breach or charges a fee which is prohibitive, then an owner can apply to the upper tribunal, lands chamber, to modify or discharge the restrictive covenants. However, this process can be costly and time consuming with no guarantee of success. Even if one was successful, costs would not be paid by the beneficiaries of the covenant. And in fact, beneficiaries of the covenant objection were to be successful. If it was to be successful, you may be forced to pay their costs, which of course is far from ideal. Now, as above, if you and your client feel that a restrictive covenant is unreasonable, you can make that application to the upper tribunal to have it modified or discharged. And in order to discharge the covenant, you must typically satisfy at least one of the following. The covenant is out of date. There is agreement to the discharge or modification between all those with the benefit of the restriction. Now, of course, this could amount to many parties having to be involved. You know, think of a covenant which benefits an estate you may end up needing permission from all homeowners on that estate. And of course, uh, everyone's different with their own opinions on what is reasonable and what isn't. The covenant may restrict a reasonable use of the land. Again, the original motives around the covenant and why it was set up are pertinent here. You know, limits on selling tea from a building may not have anticipated the rise in cafe culture, even if tea sales don't get close to those of coffee. What was the motivation for someone prohibiting that selling of tea in the first place? This is a, an example we came across relatively recently. And how pertinent is it now, um, given sort of modern intent? And then finally, it may be that no injury will be caused to those entitled to the benefit of the covenant by reason of its discharge or modification, which, as I say, can then lead to that, that discharge or modification to the benefit of the property owner. That being said, Proceeding with works while ignoring a restrictive covenant can be extremely ris risky. In a worst case scenario, you could be forced to completely undo the work and to pay compensation to the beneficiary of the covenant. Ultimately, you can choose to investigate or insure. However, it should be noted that if you decide to investigate and resolve the restrictive covenant first, you may exclude the possibility of insurance or at the very least create a situation where some certain conditions may apply within the insurance or premiums may be higher. So if investigation is impractical or it's unwanted, then the legal indemnity insurance route may be preferable. And there are a number of reasons why that, why that may be. The covenants may be old, the original covenantee may be deceased or a defunct company, or it may be unclear which land benefits the covenants. Alternatively, the benefiting party may be known, but they may not agree to a release or modification. And as we touched on earlier, this could be costly and take an unacceptably long time. Um, an insurance policy which protects the insured from costs involved in the event of a claim against the breach of the covenant may then be that acceptable alternative to investigation. Now, restrictive covenant indemnity insurance can usually be attained when a covenant has been breached for a minimum of 12 months without complaint. But of course, depending on the type of breach and lesser time period can definitely be considered. 
And we at CLS pride ourselves on the speed with which we can respond to bespoke policy requirements in order to help a transaction progress and a client be covered in respect of a risk they may otherwise be, uh, be open to. Now, our next case study highlights the value of indemnity policies in dealing with neighbours who turn out to be somewhat less than helpful. Now here, the indemnity policy enabled a project to progress and cost to be covered that otherwise may have led to a six-figure loss on the uh, part of the insured party. Now, the policyholder in this example owned a house on a large plot in the Midlands and decided to build a new house on part of that plot to sell on. Neighbouring properties were believed correctly to have the benefit of a restrictive covenant that could restrict development on the land, so cover was put in place. However, it didn't look like a claim was likely throughout the planning process and even well into the build. The neighbour who was the main risk had even verbally given his blessing for the development after initially putting in a written objection to the planning authority. That might well set alarms, uh, alarms going in to begin with. However, he then said he changed his mind and wrote to the insured, claiming to have the benefit of said covenant when the building was complete and a buyer was actually lined up. Now, you might say this was a tactical approach by the neighbour, I couldn't possibly comment, but nonetheless, the insured, now terrified by the buyer's lender getting spooked and losing the buyer altogether, let alone the, uh, the value, cost of the construction itself, made a claim under the policy. Now, the CLS claims team instructed specialist solicitors whose first move was to assess the enforceability of the covenant and put together a report for the insurer. And there's also investigated the likely development profit and what a court might typically award the beneficiary of the covenant in lieu of an injunction. Now, a court can typically award in the region of 30 to 50 percent of the profit in these sorts of instances. And it was decided that the fragility of the insured's sale meant that a quick initial offer to the neighbour would be the best move. And this was made at £20,000. The offer was refused, but a message was sent to the neighbour that the desire was to resolve the matter in a timely fashion. Now, after the initial offer was rejected, it became quite hard to get the neighbour to re-engage, and our concern was that they simply wanted to block the sale of the newly built property. Um, to break the deadlock, our solicitors doubled their efforts to get a deal, even offering to go in person to meet the neighbour and their solicitors. And eventually, their persistence paid off with a deal being struck for £50,000 in exchange for the release of the covenant, as well as the neighbour's reasonable legal costs. Now, while this was a larger sum than first expected, and in fact, this was right around the limits of what a court might reasonably be expected to award the neighbour, um, however, the claims team and the panel solicitors were aware that prolonging the dispute by going to court would have taken several months and have lost our insured, the buyer, for their new property. And the 50k settlement that the policy paid out, uh, the 50k settlement allowed our insured to get his sale completed, the new owner to move on, and everyone to sort of essentially progress within six months of the claim being notified. And the insured also had benefited from £12,000 worth of legal advice and case handling. And I think it's fair to say they were happy with the outcome and how the policy had come to their aid. So some claimants um, who benefit from restrictive covenants give up quickly. Some dig in and then open, they can make life difficult for, in this case, a would-be developer. Um, some make life difficult in order to get a payoff. Restrictive covenant claims are less about the covenants and more about the people. And it's the handling of these people, as well as the use of specialist property dispute lawyers, that make the CLS restrictive covenant policy such a valuable asset for those burdened by restrictive covenants. So just to close up now, we'll turn our attention to the specific CLS restrictive covenant policy. And in a nutshell, our policy would cover the situation where a property is subject to a known or unknown restrictive covenant, which may or may not have been breached. A policy would cover any party with the benefit enforcing or attempting to enforce the covenant after the inception of the policy. Now, of course, historically, each case was underwritten with the benefit of a presentation from the solicitor who would carry out title investigations and, and provide copies of title documentation, statutory, de statutory declarations and the like. But of course, this has now been streamlined and the vast majority of our policies can be obtained online, of course, via the InfoTrack platform.
And if you find yourself in a situation where your client requires a restrictive covenant policy, obtaining one couldn't be simpler, subject, of course, to confirmations of certain statements of fact, which I'm sure most of you will be familiar with. But once you've abstained, uh, um, confirmed those statements of fact, of course, you can proceed through with the order. But if for any reason you can't agree with them, we can and do still consider the risk, but on a bespoke basis. And if this scenario does arise, then via the InfraTrack platform, one of our underwriters would be informed about the requirement for a bespoke policy. We'll then get in touch and help discuss and discuss the, the nature of the risk with you in order to then hopefully arrive at a policy which benefits your client. So as I say, just because you can't confirm a particular statement of fact, it doesn't mean we cannot consider the risk. Our standard statements of fact associated with this policy are that the property in question is a single house or flat in England or Wales, that the restrictive covenant to be insured is more than 12 months old, and that the property that has existed unaltered for the previous 12 months. But we absolutely can and do insure properties where alterations have been made more recently, you know, nine months, six months, even earlier, depending on the nature of the alteration. So the statements of fact are just that start point for our underwriters. Um, statement of fact four, neither the seller nor the buyer is aware of any dispute, objection, or attempt to enforce a restrictive covenant against the property. Um, neither the seller nor the buyer has communicated with any third party regarding a restrictive covenant relating to the policy, property. And neither the seller nor the buyer is aware of any decision or judgment upholding the enforceability of a restrictive covenant relating to the policy. But if you can sail through those, then you have our uh, policy available online. And if you can't, then as I say, our underwriters would be only too happy to help in order to construct something that fits the nature of your client's transaction. That brings us to the end of our webinar. I certainly hope you've found this useful. If you have any questions regarding the content of the webinar, um, all my contact details are on screen. Um, I can see some questions have come in, so we will um, follow up with uh, follow up on those straight after this webinar and come back to you. Um, Infotrax details are up on screen, of course, as well. Um, if you have any requirements which are not covered by our standard policies, we absolutely will work to accommodate these. And there's been a number of occasions where lawyers' requirements have led to a permanent change in our policy terms to ensure they provide cover for a specific risk. So um, please do get in touch. And finally, my thanks to InfoTrack for arranging this webinar. As Adam mentioned right at the start, you'll receive a copy of the slides uh, shortly. And I'd like to take this opportunity to say on behalf of everyone at InfoTrack and CLS Property Insight, um, please stay safe and well, um, stay in touch, and uh, we look forward to you joining us on the next of these webinars. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Steve, did you want to broach any of these questions now? Let's have a look. So first one, are you aware of any claims being made on a restrictive covenant indemnity policy? Absolutely, yes. So the, the, the um, two we've just looked at are, are probably the lead examples we give in these webinars. But yes, it is a policy against which there are, uh, there are claims processed. OK, all right. Thank you. Um, so there are quite a few questions here, but let's go. Let's just quickly run through a couple of them. And I think we can, they may be um, too specific and you might want to go back to the individuals themselves. So mm -hmm. please feel free to say that if that's the case. Um, yeah. So the, question, the, the reason given for not providing indemnity cover for breach of positive covenant was that there would be no financial loss, example being maintaining a garden or fence, etc. What about the situation whereby the person with the benefit of that positive covenant sues the homeowner for financial loss because they can prove their property is un unsaleable due to the lack of the maintenance of the neighbouring garden and boundary fence? No, well, I think that's what I'm going to have to put to our uh, put to our claims team and see how they would view a view a query like that. So I'd be more than happy to come back to you on that if you're if you're happy to wait for a, a day or two. I think that's okay. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Um, uh, another one here. I have a matter where a kitchen extension was carried out in 1998. There is a covenant in the 1961 conveyance preventing any building structure or erection without prior consent of the vendor. Is it correct that a breach of a restrictive covenant cannot be enforced after 20 years? 
I'm not sure whether it can be reinforced after a period of more than 20 years, but I think there is a condition within the, um, the well, it's going to call it the CML handbook, the UK finance um, handbook, whereby if a restrictive covenant hasn't been breached um, after, for a period of 20 years or more, then a conveyance isn't necessarily required to take out restrictive covenant insurance, uh, legal indemnity insurance, in order to cover that cover that risk. So I'll have to come back to you on the nature of the question, but it may be that if there is, even if the covenant is enforceable, a lack of insurance policy against that covenant doesn't necessarily mean a breach of the UK finance lenders handbook. Okay, thank you, because that'll cover off another question there, which is my understanding is that restrictive covenants become un unenforceable after 20 years, so we just might want to check that. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to get breach of restrictive covenants indemnity insurance for a new build before planning permission has been applied for, uh, where the new build will be in breach of a restrictive covenant? So, um, once again, I'll have to check in with the underwriters on that, Adam, if that's okay. Okay, that, that's fine. That's fine. Um, and a question from someone here saying, should we contact you via insurance brokers as we are not licensed? Um, it depends slightly what you mean by licensed. If you mean um, you're not part of the exempt professional firms register, then my understanding would be however you seek to access insurance, you would need to be on the EPF register in order to provide that insurance to your client as an ancillary intermediary, which is the um, status that most law firms seek to get under um, uh, the insurance distribution directive regulations. Um, so I think whether if that's what you mean by licensing, my suggestion would be that wherever you go, whether you're getting your, your indemnities via a broker, whether you're coming to InfoTrack, you will need to be on the EPF register in order to market insurance to your clients. Um, the status of ancillary intermediary is one whereby the provision insurance is provision of insurance comes as a um, a secondary result of your primary service. So obviously in this case, it's um, you know, managing the, the, the property transaction, a stage in which requires the provision insurance to cover, to cover certain risks. Um, if I've misunderstood your question there, Kaz, please do get back in touch and we can, uh, we can sort of follow up on that. Okay, thank you, Steve. I think what we'll do is, um, is we will look at each, in the, each of the questions. So there are quite a few questions here that are very specific. Um, and probably need a little bit more questioning before we're, before Steve's actually able to answer them. Um, and we'll, we will come back to each and every individual who's posed that question there. I have a log of them. So yeah. we'll come back to each and every, everybody. So um, is that okay, Steve? Yeah. Absolutely. My, my, my thanks for posting the questions genuinely. And I'll, I, will, I will put all of them to our underwriting team and come back to each and every one of you. Great stuff. Okay. Thank you. So all that remains for me to say is thank you to Steve for um, running today's webinar and thank you to all of those who have attended today. Um, I hope you're staying safe, staying well, and hopefully we'll be back in the office soon um, as quickly as possible, in my opinion, and the market can pick back up. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Speak to you soon. Cheers. Bye.